you know, the materials world is actually the, the thing that powers pretty much everything in the economy. Every product that we love is defined by the materials that make it. And so, well, I think what we do in, in AI is really powerful and is going to launch materials forward. What I think is really important for people to understand is that the materials that we rely on are the determinant of our environmental impact, our energy efficiency, how good our products feel or don't feel, how we experience the world. Welcome to the inaugural episode of M4 Edge, or if you're a more formal kind of person. Welcome to Macro. Micro, Michael. Marco. And Startups at the Edge. I'm Michael Leifman, the one without the Italian accent. <laughs> and I am Marco Nunziata, the one without the baritone. In this podcast, we examine macro trends through the micro lens of startups. How new technologies will change the way the economy functions and which companies are leading the revolution. Our first guest, Greg Malholland, CEO and founder of Citrine Informatics, was like you, bold enough to give us a try. Citrine uses machine learning to improve material science and materials discovery. We thought Citrine was a perfect company to launch our show, not just because we believe AI changes everything, but because material science improvements can also change everything, from how much energy a good consumes, to how stable or soft something is, to what basic commodities consumers demand, to how we dispose of waste products, including potentially carbon dioxide. Digital innovation creates all the buzz, but we are material boys and girls, and we live in a material world. Materials Informatics combines the digital and the physical, a recipe we believe is the key to this fourth industrial revolution. And the companies that are in the materials development industry are all the huge companies like Dow DuPont, 3M, BASF, Corning. If anything has a high probability of fundamentally affecting broad segments of the economy, this is it. Materials discovery is the lifeblood of new technology. And applying artificial intelligence to the process can shave years sometimes decades off of the discovery timeline and time to market. And since it's the lifeblood, an acceleration in something this fundamental can be like the economy getting a new heart. In fact, the productivity slowdown we have seen in the past several years may be in part related to a slowdown in materials discovery, which artificial intelligence may now be starting to reverse. This was a really rich discussion, and we certainly learned a lot. We trust you'll get as much out of it as we did. Thanks for being curious. Welcome to M4 Edge and enjoy the episode. Perfect. So Greg Mulholland, CEO and founder of Citrine Informatics, welcome to our podcast and thanks for being uh, guinea pig number one. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, so of course I was Googling around to try to find some information on you and the company, et cetera. And I Googled Citrine as well. And I'm, I'm sure you know this, but some of the definitions for Citrine out there are very, <laughs> are very new agey and sort of crystal spiritual kind of stuff. And so I, I thought I would read them to you and just, you know, get your, get your take. And then I'm interested <laughs> about how you came up with the name Citrine. So one of them is Citrine is a bright energetic stone that enhances mental clarity and allows for the flow of ideas and visualization. And another natural citrine is a premier stone of manifestation, imagination, and personal will. Carrying the power of the sun, it's warm and comforting. And, you know, it goes on and on. And so uh, I, I'm sure this is exactly what you had in mind. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting because so, so citrine is, uh, as you've highlighted, a yellow phase of quartz. So it's a, it's a semi-precious stone. Um, we always like to say it's, it's often, uh, often uh, counterfeited but uh, never often or never duplicated. Um, and so we're really a one of a kind valuable thing. Um, actually, the real, the real source of the name came from a, a different root, which is uh, the word citronation. And cit citronation was the, was the process by which alchemists believed you could turn silver into gold. It was the bringing of yellowness into a metal. And so we always like to say, we, we take your valuable materials data and make it even more valuable. Nice, I like it, excellent. Okay. So let's uh, let's get on to the to the real stuff here, and maybe if if you want to start by explaining a little bit about the company to our audience, you know what what is the problem that you're trying to solve? 
how'd you come up with the, with this idea? And you know, Marco's words, why, why on earth are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question I have to ask myself every day. Um, you know, I, when we started the company, we had this, this pretty important insight. And it's one that I, I think uh, you and Marco are maybe, maybe uh, pretty aware of, which is the materials industry is changing quite a lot. And, and the future of work is changing quite a lot. What, the, the characteristics of a company that is successful in a very traditional industry are changing. And, and for a long time in the materials and chemicals industry, the best companies were defined by their operational efficiency. How efficiently, how low cost, how high quality could they produce the commodity products that they produced? And in the mid 2000s, something started to change quite a lot. Um, and that is, you know, with the low labor rise of low labor cost economies and a lot of different um, you know, sort of competitive factors, operational efficiency became table stakes. It became the minimum, and quickly companies that that were winning companies that were dominating in their markets were the ones that could move most quickly. They were the ones that could innovate and that could get those, those critical design wins. And, you know, the example I always like to use is, is Coring's Gorilla Glass. You may not have heard of Gorilla Glass, but odds are you just touched it or something just like it. It's the surface glass of most mobile devices, famously introduced into the first iPhone at special request by Steve Jobs in 2005. You know, Corning has to have a new Gorilla Glass every year, basically, and a new variant. Sometimes it's not a whole new version because Apple always wants the next generation phone cover to be stronger. Samsung always wants the next generation tablet cover to be stronger. And so what, what used to be a three to five year development cycle um, is now a one year development cycle. And these traditional companies never had a pathway to do that. And so that's my long way of saying we saw an opportunity there to solve a big problem with the new technology. And that was using AI, that's artificial intelligence, to help optimize the development pathway of these new materials and chemicals that would allow them to achieve the same or better results than they would have already, but using the data that, that has become their asset. These companies have hundreds of years of history, and it's an opportunity for us to uh, use AI to leverage that into faster product development and, and better materials and products. And so, Greg, maybe you can spend a few more words articulating how Citrine does this, because in the past, as I understand it, the traditional process of developing new materials was very hit and miss. People would try, they would experiment, they would test and see what they could come up with. How does Citrine make the process so much more efficient and faster? So what we realized is that, you know, the the process that you've described, this trial and error process, is really what most scientists would look in the mirror and say is the scientific method. They come up with a hypothesis, they test that hypothesis, and then they learn something and, and start over, they, they iterate. And what we realized because of this is that the difference between a really good scientist and a really terrible one is how good are they at coming up with new hypotheses? And so all we said was we can make a very small change in the world. And that is, we're going to take an enormous amount of data, make it available during the hypothesis generation process, and we're going to use a set of artificial intelligence tools that identify trends in that data so that the product developers can just come up with better hypotheses, come up with things that are more likely to hit their targets. And just like a product designer would or a scientist would on their own, every time that they do an experiment or generate new data, we integrate that back into the model and the model gets smarter along with the scientists. And so we like to think of it as your partner, you know, your perfect lab assistant that can never forget anything, isn't biased by the last results and can really help you march toward a better target. And a simple follow-up question to this, Greg, is uh, what kind of data are we talking about? Are these data about uh, the specific characteristics of the existing materials, how they're being used? And where do you find the data? How easily accessible are they? <laughs> you raise a really important point and that is you know the the achilles heel or the the secret advantage of every ai system is the data it has access to and in the materials world we have a bit of a problem there because if you if you go to google and you see their data sets they have millions or billions or trillions of data points a day i mean it's an absurd amount of data in materials you might have say say alloys for example aluminum alloys there are about five to 10,000 materials that have ever been rigorously tested in aluminum alloys. And so if you take that, take a Google approach to that, 
you're not going to get too far because you, you're assuming there's all that data there. And so what we actually had to do was figure out a way to integrate other information, integrate scientific and, and chemical theory into our machine learning models. And by doing that, we're able to take advantage of the data that is available, any new data that becomes available, and the tacit knowledge of the product developers that, that know this space so well. And so, you know, I, I think one of the important things to know is that our approach is not the way to go in a lot of areas. You know, if you have that volume of data, it's not worth it to undertake the effort that we undertake. But in an area as valuable as materials, where a single test can cost a million dollars or more, it's really important to use that data you have really efficiently. And, and we're really the best of the world in doing that. I'm assuming that, you know, if you're contracted by a uh, materials manufacturer um, th th to find, you know, a product that has XYZ characteristics, they own the final formula, right? They own the recipe at the end, correct? The, the IP is theirs? IP being intellectual property. Yes. yes. So what happens to everything in between does you, you know for the ai for the ml to get better obviously it has to incorporate all of the learning all of the trial and error uh algorithmically um do does your client does your customer own that or like how does the system grow and continue to learn yeah so so when our customers work with our system anything they do within it is theirs um, you know, I, I would love to see a world where everyone shares data freely and there's, you know, uh, there's just everybody's sharing everything, but that's just not the reality of our industry today. Um, and, and so when someone uses our system, it is, uh, once it touches their data, it, it belongs to them. Um, now, what's really important is our system learns in multiple ways. Um, the first is on the customer data. And, and if, if you are, you know, 3M or Dow or DuPont or Corning, you, that stays isolated to you. That doesn't get shared with anyone. But we're constantly adding additional algorithms to our system and new capabilities, new analysis types, new ways for the system to actually engage with those customers. And the second way is we work with a great network of universities and national labs to use our system in a university environment, which gives us critical product feedback, it gives us access to a lot of fundamental data, and it gives us a, um, a lot of uh, really, um, sort of proactive information about that, the ways that our customers want to use our system. And I think the most important piece though, is that more and more we're finding that the companies we work with want to run the system themselves. They want to build a capability for using data science internally. And when I think about the future of work in the materials industry, it's that you have these data scientists who are truly expert that live within a company. And they'll use a platform like ours to, as their tool set, as their, as their way of making themselves accessible across the company. But they are really creating a, an, IP, um, an IP asset for that company in the data they're selecting and the models they're building. And it's totally secure from anything else that, that any other company might do because it becomes their competitive advantage. Right, right. Okay, so you are sort of, you're supplying the platform and you're supplying the algorithms uh, as a whatever software as a service, um, you're not Citrine is not doing the analytics on the on. You're not solving the customer's material problem. You're providing them the tool to solve their problem. That's that's generally what we do. Uh, of course, I'm very lucky to have, uh, frankly, the world's best team for materials informatics on my team. Um, and so, you know, if a customer needs us to kind of work in a consulting capacity or provide that expert expertise, we're more than happy to do that. But in general, uh, it's our preference that our customers develop that capability over time because as much as I would love to have, you know, the, the number of people and the amount of expertise that I can go uh, service every company on the planet, um, that's just not realistic. Our, our customers are the best in the world at what they do and they should be leveraging that knowledge. And, and my team is great at machine learning, but um, you know, we need we need them to be driving the process too. And Greg, I would love to I would love to get your thoughts on the point you raised a moment ago, which is uh, the trade off between uh, the the intellectual property of the data and the power of big data. In the case of industrial companies, uh, the competition is very much a factor, and as you were alluding to companies want to develop their own capability, they want to do it in-house, does this uh, slow down the process uh, at which uh, 
new materials can be discovered because you can't aggregate enough information since uh, no company knows what everybody else is doing? Well, I, I mean, I think that's a, that's a particularly negative way to look at it. I mean, it, if more data is always better when it comes to AI. And so, sure, if you had a, a coalition of companies come together and they were all going to share their data fully, that would lead to the best outcomes. Um, but I actually think that the benchmark is less about what could happen if the entire culture of the industry changed and is much more about what are we doing relative to today. Uh, and today we rely mostly on the intuition and, and understanding of a scientist and we can do better than that by bringing data into the picture. Um, you know, a lot of these companies are hundreds of years old or over a hundred years old and you know, you're able, they've, they've accumulated data over this whole time. And so, to actually combine that data with what the scientists do today provides an extreme lift. It provides a, a competitive advantage. And, and sure, it isn't, uh, you know, it's not a pool of every experiment that's ever been run in the history of humanity, um, but it does provide a pretty big, uh, big impact. And, and frankly, we see a, a, a regular 50 to 70% decrease in the length of time it takes to develop a new material by integrating AI. So, um, you know, the impact is actually pretty large. No, this is impressive by any standard, and I don't disagree with you at all. In my defense, I'm an economist, we're the dismal scientists, so I always <laughs> bring in a negative twist in some way. This is, there's, I have to say there's an irony here because it's usually me who's the one to be more, you know, uh, dismal about <laughs> these things. So I'm glad, Mark, are you, you know, you threw the first spear. Um, so talk a little bit, Greg, if you can, about the existing process for materials design, materials discovery and design. You know, I've heard, you, you just said you can cut the time 50 to 60%. I've seen all sorts of things, you know, decades to years or years to days. What is, if there is a typical way, what does materials discovery really look like? Like, so for Gorilla Glass, you mentioned, the story I, I read is that it was actually first discovered in the 60s or something for windshield glass. Mm -hmm. And it was only when uh, Jobs said, hey, I need it tomorrow or something. They said, oh yeah, we, we've got this thing. So. What does that process that you're disrupting normally look like? And how have data scientists and the AI community generally sort of fit into this, what I imagine perhaps wrongly to be sort of a, you know, kind of insular group of, of chemists and, and physicists? Yeah, so, so there are many types of materials and chemicals development. And I think, uh, you know, the, the canonical number is 10 to 20 years um, from, from lab bench to insertion into a product. Um, and, and that's a really long time. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine even what a product 20 years from now would look like um, because things are changing so quickly. And so, you know, obviously there's a huge incentive to speed that up. Now, what's important to understand is actually that 20 years is, is segmented into initial materials discovery. There's a lot of times qualification and testing that needs to happen to make sure you're not going to poison people or have weird failure modes or whatever. You have scale up and then you have full on manufacturing. And so there's a role for data and AI in each of these. Um, and, and, you know, we work in the earlier stages of that today and are working our way out into scale up and manufacturing. But, you know, there's also, so, so that's the first kind of characterization. The second is, you know, there are some times where you're trying to invent something wholly new, which is what that 20 year timeline refers to. There's also a lot of times when you're trying to take something you know that works pretty well and tweak it to suit a need that you have. And so a great example of that is if you're, a, uh, if you're an automaker and you have your brake rotors, right? It turns out brake rotors are really heavy. And so if you can reduce the weight on those by just a couple percent, you can really gain a lot of fuel economy. And so what, what you might do as a scientist there is you say, look, well, you know, there's this, there's this steel that I can use but unfortunately it doesn't work so well at high temperatures. And you know, it turns out you want your brake rotors to work at high temperatures. And so you might say, how can I modify this steel? So it's still basically the same thing, but I'm just, I just wanna tweak it a few different ways such that it's going to still be as strong, but it's also going to be stable at high temperatures. And in that case, what traditionally has happened is someone said, well, you know, historically, if I put a little silicon in, you know, add a little silicon pixie dust, maybe that, that improves the performance of this material. And that's worked pretty well, actually. You know, these scientists are smart people and they have a lot of experience. But what we found is that we've kind of, in this generation of materials, hit a, a bit of a level of diminishing returns. And so what used to be something you'd get a five or 10% increase on, now you're getting one or 2%. And so 
what we say is, look, the data can tell you volumes about these materials you're working with. And by bringing it all together, we're oftentimes able to open up new research directions that say, oh, you, you were using silicon, maybe if you used a combination of aluminum, aluminum and lithium, you can actually get to a better result. And, and it, it begins to uh, open up the search space a little bit and it, and it helps us to achieve those goals even when you're talking about something that is a much shorter development cycle, maybe it's a three to five year development cycle, but it's because it's closer to what you know already, um, but you're able to kind of narrow in much more quickly um, and you take that three to five year development cycle and turn it into a two year development cycle. Perhaps. So you touched a little bit on, on a question that Marco and I were, were talking about sort of just before uh, you joined the call actually. And this is, you know, how locked in are the, the materials companies to their materials? So the example I, I thought of was, you know, if you're Lafarge, are they going to ask you for a new, better type of cement? Are they going to ask you for a totally new building material because now they can? Or if you're mm -hmm. corning, you know, something that's not glass, but something that has, you know, glass-like properties or whatever. Are, are, they, are they locked sure. in or are they, does this give them the, I mean, it, it certainly gives them the, uh, the possibility of a much broader universe. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, you know, I, I think materials companies are, are in a bit of a, a challenging situation all the time. And, and that is because they have this huge amount of, uh, you know, CapEx sitting out, right? They've got factories specialized in doing certain things. And, you know, if Lafarge goes away from cement and, and goes into some building material with some totally new set of manufacturing requirements, they're building new factories. And so typically the way these materials companies approach things is they look at the short term kind of uh, how do I use what I have today development cycle and be as agile as possible there. And they look at the future and they say, where are we going to invest? Let's find new materials classes that we want to work in. And so they'll say, well, maybe, maybe there's this new kind of uh, aero cement or something, some, you know, really cool new material that is, is something we want to invest in in the future. And then we might use something like citrine to evaluate various new ones of these and see if it's worth our investing in the, the physical capacity to manufacture it at scale. But what's most interesting, I would say, is actually somewhat less around sort of these, these really high volume materials and much more around the, uh, the highly tailored materials enabled by things like 3D printing and other advanced manufacturing techniques. Because if you think about... Um, how those things come together, you know, 3D printing is, you know, you have a, a metal powder or a plastic, you know, a, a plastic that you melt and you can mix things together. And so, you know, in a world where we usually think of steel as steel or a particular type of steel as a particular type of steel, you can say, well, I have a steel bar or I have a steel handle or, or some part that is graded over the period of the entire part. And it actually changes composition based on what you need, because it turns out, you know, only certain parts of it need to be strong and other parts should be really light. When you start to use a system like citrines where you can optimize materials very precisely, you can actually think about co-optimizing geometry and material at the same time, which leads to a pretty cool benefit. It really lets you optimize your products. And so when we talk to these companies, there's, there's the business model today that many of them are thinking about, which is very, you know, we want to be agile, but we're making a lot of the same stuff. Um, and then there's the next generation business model, which is how do we tailor every one of our products to exactly our customers' needs? Because that is the future of the materials industry. The future of the materials industry is not, you know, a billion tons of the same products over and over again. It's, it's really about being highly tailored and, and agile and responsive. And on this note, Greg, I would like to pick your brain on a couple of related issues. One is uh, you were talking about the interrelation of uh, artificial intelligence, new materials, citrine, and uh, new production techniques like 3D printing. And so my first question would be, to what extent are you seeing already new demand for your services, for your support being driven in particular by new production processes like 3D printing or new design processes like generative design. Related to this, the second thing I would like to get your thoughts on is uh, one thing we've seen with uh, things like 3D printing and the ability to produce parts with different geometries is that one of the constraints becomes uh, 
the human's ability to think outside of the box, right? We're so used to thinking of one particular geometry for a product, and that geometry was dictated by the constraints of the traditional process. And so I'm wondering, both in terms of the processes, but also in terms of coming up with new materials, are we still in a stage where uh, Citrine opens up uh, an enormous potential universe of new materials, but we are limited by our bounded imagination. And will this change in the future? What are you seeing? Here? Uh, I think we as humans are always limited by our bounded imagination. And, and it's our goal as a company to help people start to think about things in new ways, identify new trends, uh, see, see new ideas emerge from, from the data. Um, you know, we have seen companies really think hard about how do we use these new production technologies? How do we use these new materials? But I think they run up against what you just said quite a lot, which is, you know, it's really hard for us to see what the future is going to look like and, and predict it when there's these big changes that have been coming. And so, you know, that, that's why we say it's about agility. It's about responsiveness and it's about continuously investing in data and AI such that you can respond as you see new things emerge rather than trying to put a finger on where 20 years from now is going to be. What does an agile materials company look like? <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, I think there are a lot of companies that, that think they're there and I, and I think only time will tell. Um, but the, you know, I, I think the, an agile materials company it, it defines success in a different way than a traditional materials company. A traditional materials company defines success in how many tons or pounds or whatever the unit is of product they sold this year. An agile materials company defines its success by how many design wins did they get? How many times were their products chosen because they were the right fit? And having that as an incentive within your company is the thing that changes how you develop new things. And it changes how you invest and it changes how you build tooling. Um, and to me, that's the critical difference. I think there are a lot of knock-on effects from that, but that's the critical difference. So when you think about your target market, I mean, it's maybe blindingly obvious, but materials are literally everywhere. <laughs> and there are, there are lots of opportunities for improvement in kind of everything. Obviously, some have a greater economic value than, than others. I am an energy guy, and so I, as I know you are as well, and... Um, one of the big debates or discussions, I should say, right now in the climate change world is the use of carbon as, a, as an input product rather than uh, just as an emission we have to deal with somehow or control. And so that potentially opens up just a vast, vast amount of potential product design questions. But where, I, mean, I don't know if that's one that you guys have started to tackle, but of the various either end use consumer industries or materials industries, where, where do you think that action is now? Where's the most demand for new designs, new materials? It's impossible for me to put a finger on any one. Um, you know, there are some areas where, where there's much less innovation, but I would say, you know, the ones that always jump to mind are, you know, batteries. Everybody hates the batteries, never last long enough. I would say that one that's emerging and that, that is a theme that, that I love to see because I, like you said, uh, I have a, a love for energy in the environment. Um, is in green chemistry, you know, in, in figuring out how to make things that are just as performant as they always have been, but are much less damaging to the environment. So how do you make, you know, biodegradable plastics that don't melt when you put them in the microwave? How do you make dyes for clothing that don't contain things that are just really nasty to dispose of? And then, and then on the back end, how do we actually use good inputs? So, so like you said, is there a way to consume carbon dioxide and produce high value plastics? And you know, that's an area we have actually done some work. You know, we were able to, to share with the world that we did some work with BASF and catalysis, which is kind of one of the methods you'd use there. And, and that's, a, um, you know, that's a really exciting place to be. As a podcast about the future of the economy, I think we would be remiss if we didn't ask you something about AI and jobs. And so, you know, what, what is a, an in-house material science team look like? You know, how many people at a, at a big company like BASF or, or Dow DuPont, are we talking hundreds of people? What, what does that look like? And does this change that structure? Does, does your kind of technology change that structure? It, it absolutely changes the structure. Um, there's a, um, there's a, a, a couple major changes that are coming. So today, to, to kind of answer your question, there is a, um, 
a structure in place. It's usually small teams. It's usually, you know, somewhere between five and 20 people um, working on a single development program. Sometimes it's a little bit larger depending on the structure. Um, and that includes, you know, experts in the materials, oftentimes PhDs, uh, oftentimes experts in manufacturing or application. Um, and then you have technicians and other people that are kind of uh, the experts in running the tests, making the materials, kind of the, the on the ground uh, expertise. Um, you'll notice that there's a ton of expertise in these teams. There's nobody who is just a hanger on. Everybody has their specific domain knowledge, which is critically important to think about the future because this domain knowledge does not lose value. And so where, where, the, where the, the future is going though, is that more or less now you have scientists and developers and you have people who are, who are doing characterization testing, kind of fabrication, technician, um, technician sorts of, of activities. And from our view, we're actually going to increase the, the diversity of people that are doing this work. Because now you have this new, this new game in town called data. And so you need people that really specialize and have expertise in understanding data. And I have some of these on my team, but as we talked about earlier, these companies want to build capability. The, the second piece is that the, we need data scientists. We need people who are experts in using that data and coupling it with materials expertise. Because it turns out, as I mentioned before, there isn't that much materials data out there. You can't just blindly point a computer at it and say, hey, go solve this problem for me. You really need to bring that domain expertise into the equation. And then the material scientist continues to do the material scientist work. We need that expertise. And the technician continues to work with the physical material because even in the case where you have robots, the robots aren't doing everything. And so we actually see a broadening of the number of skills required. And that may in some cases lead to a, uh, an increase in the number of people on the team. It'll certainly lead to an increase in the number of activities they do. Um, and in some cases it may mean the team is the same size, they operate more efficiently, but they just got a different sort of set of profiles on the team itself. But I don't think in the development world, we see a case where, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we can point and click and, and out of nowhere, a new, a new material is invented without any domain expertise coming in. That's, that's, many, many, many years away and, and you know, in the hundreds probably, if, if I'm to be honest. And talking of building the right teams, uh, Greg, take us back to the origins of uh, Citrine. How did you guys go about it? How did you build the team? What was it like? <sighs> you know, I, I think the uh, building, building startup teams is uh, a bit of a black art, I think. You know, uh, I was very lucky to find... Um, to find a partner to start the business with that had deep expertise in, in materials and machine learning. He did one of the very early PhDs in materials informatics. Um, and, and he was sort of my counterpart in thinking about the, the physics and, and sort of machine learning behind things. And I was really the guy who'd been through the mud in the, in, in the industry. I kind of experienced the challenges of uh, materials and, and materials development. Um, and at that time, we, we sort of asked the question, what other skills do we lack? And we invited a third person to join our, our founding team that was an expert in scientific computing because we needed to, to write good code. And uh, I was not the guy to do that. And, and, and actually Bryce probably could have, but we, we could use the skills. Um, and then as we grew the team, what we realized is it was important to select for skills. That, that's obviously key. But perhaps more importantly, was to find the people that were that had that agility, and man, I'm hitting that hitting that theme hard today. Um, to have the agility to understand that that none of our roles were going to stay the same for more than a few months. That as a company, we needed to constantly cover new bases, and so finding people that were really talented, had a really high bar of excellence, and were willing to jump on whatever needed to be taken care of to make us successful was really the early part of building the team. And now we're a little bit bigger and we have to you know, hire specialists in different areas. Um, but there's still a huge dose of you know, everybody pitching in on everything because you know, there's, there's always new things emerging every day. And I need to trust my team that they are going to cover it even with something we haven't seen before. I read in one of the stories I found about you guys is that your, your co-founder Bryce is is really into saber metrics, and I'm, I'm wondering if you're both baseball nerds, and really if you've, as a company, solved the mystery of how the baseballs were fabricated last year to produce all these extra home runs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I Bryce is a huge baseball baseball guy. I uh, baseball is not my sport, um, not your thing. so I, I leave that one to him. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, you can put the question and let us know. <laughs> I will. 
I, I know we're, we're kind of closing in on our time here. I've got a question that I, I think of as sort of the, I'd, I'd like you to wax philosophic here question. <laughs> so historians, you know, we talk about the eras of human history by their materials, the Bronze Age, the Stone Age, the Iron Age. And we are often now uh, referred to current, current days as the Silicon Age or the Digital Age. And so I think it's sort of perfect that a, you know, an AI company is, uh, investigate, is uh, investigating new materials. It's, there's something sort of poetic about that. And so I'd like you to sort of reflect on that. Where do you think we are, the, the place of materials in the economy in 15 years and 100 years? You know, what, is, what, what does the world look like because of what you're doing now? The reason the ages have been named for the materials is because the materials enabled massive societal breakthroughs. I mean, you know, we look very different now because we had silicon and because we figured out how to make a, a transistor. Um, so if, if I look out 15, 20, 50 years, um, you know, what I see is a, a world that is very highly customized, very highly tailored, where we're using things incredibly efficiently because we know exactly how to use them. And so the funny thing is, I actually think, I'm sure that the next age will be named by material, but I actually think we'll characterize the next age is that no one material is truly dominant, that we're using the right tool for the right job. And that's, you know, my, my, in my resource efficiency heart, what I really hope for. But, you know, I, I think there, there are materials breakthroughs around the corner that will, that will steal the show and will, will uh, lend names to an age. You know, I think there's obviously Superconductors are an area of intensive research that could lead us to all kinds of cool transportation and, and energy efficiency places, um, energy storage technologies, um, space travel. There's all kinds of cool stuff we're going to do. But if I'm to be honest, you know, it's not that everybody is getting their bronze and is now able to hunt better than they once were, or everybody's getting their iron and is now able to industrialize in new ways. It is that everybody is getting the tools they need in the most efficient way possible because of the technologies like the ones we're working on that can adaptively select materials, use resources efficiently, and help identify what to use best uh, and design the right product for the right people. And this, uh, it underscores a point that I feel very strongly about, Greg. You're probably familiar with the debate we've seen in economics on uh, productivity. There is this paradox and this uh, at times angry debate with uh, a bunch of economists who are even more negative than I am will tell you, well, all these digital innovations haven't done anything for economic growth. Productivity growth is dismal, is weaker than it has ever been. And I've always felt strongly that what we've been waiting for is the coming together of the digital and the physical. So digital technologies and artificial intelligence are coming to change the way in which the physical world, material production takes place. And this is where the productivity, the increase in efficiency, and the stronger economic growth will come about. And I think what you guys are doing is a perfect example of this. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I think when you talk about productivity, you know, productivity can be measured in many ways, but it typically doesn't tend to speak to things like, you know, we've created a new social network, which has created tremendous economic value. That's not really related to worker productivity. It's not related to personal productivity. Might be inversely so, related to productivity, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I won't comment on that. Uh, but the, uh, but, but I, I will say that I, I think your point, Marco, is, is well made, that, that we are now reaching a stage where whether it's, you know, the, the kinds of technologies we're working on or, the, or those at GE or many other companies, where we can actually merge the physical and digital worlds in really productive natural ways are the things that are going to really uh, kick us up a, a notch, so to speak, in, in the productivity and, and our ability to, to create the, the best products, the, the products we've never seen before and couldn't imagine 10 years ago. Greg, this has been a fantastic conversation. So thanks a lot for your time. I don't know if Michael has any last remarks, but otherwise, do you, Greg, have anything you want to bring up, anything that we haven't touched upon which you really want to get out there? You know, the one thing I always like to, to leave behind is that, you know, the materials world is actually the, the thing that powers pretty much everything in the economy. Every product that we love is defined by the materials that make it. And so, well, I think what we do in, in AI is really powerful and is going to launch materials forward. What I think is really important for people to understand is, is that 
the materials that we rely on are the determinant of our environmental impact, our energy efficiency, how good our products feel or don't feel, how we experience the world. Um, and so, you know, uh, you're an economist, you understand this, but I think so many people overlook how surrounded by advanced things we are and how amazing the world that we live in is. And so um, I always love to share my fascination with materials and would encourage everyone to keep an eye out for those things that perform amazingly and that have that, that create that experience for you and understand how much engineering and science went into to making them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great final answer. So again, thanks so much for, uh, for taking the time. This was a lot of fun for us. No, it was great. Michael, Marco, thank you very much for taking the time. It's been a real pleasure. It's been our pleasure. Thank you, Greg, and all the best to you and Citrine. Curious enough to want to know what we think? Marco and I have a brief discussion available on our website in which we reflect on the conversation, on Citrine and on the economy. Check it out at m4edge.com. That's M, the number four, edge.com. We're also curious to know what you thought. Drop us a line at info at m4edge.com, including suggestions for new guests. Thanks again for listening to Macro, Micro, Michael, Marco and Startups at the Edge.